Good morning, colleagues, and welcome to this session. Uh, we've had a, a wonderful higher education conference on the engaged university. Welcome to session 15. So I am Vim de Villiers. I'm the Rector and Vice Chancellor of Stellenbosch University. Session 15 of 17, so you can hear uh, the bell ringing for the last lap here. And this session, I think is gonna be very interesting. It's a reporting session. It is, the participants are the chairs of the various strategy groups within uh, USAF. And they will be providing us with their insights and report backs on and feedback on what's transpired in this conference uh, with regard to the various strategy groups. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Professor Toko Mayakiso, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Mapumalanga, to provide us with her insights uh, with regard to the Research and Innovation Strategy Group. Over to you, Toko. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Thanks, Session Chair, for the opportunity to report on the three sessions conducted under the auspices of the Research and Innovation Strategy Group, namely Research Impacts, Research Integrity and the Engaged University, and Research Collaborations, domestically and internationally. Let me start by expressing words of appreciation to all our esteemed speakers and respondents for their insightful contribution. Session chairs, staff at the USAF office for their respective contributions. Members of the USAF Research and Innovation Strategy Group and of course, conference delegates who have posed questions that have enriched the deliberations. I will then report briefly on each of the theme, mindful of their interconnectedness. The first theme being research impacts. What came true from the presentations is the importance of creating enabling environments for the conduct of research that has potential for impact to solve national and global challenges. COVID-19 being a good example in this regard. Impact has to be pursued across all disciplines and fields of study. And it is important to embed impact pathways in the research designs. The NRF has developed an impact framework that takes into consideration knowledge impact as well as societal impact. The research and innovation strategy group can contribute to shaping the NRF framework as well as its implementation plan. Lastly, the research we conduct needs to create impacts for a better future and facilitate innovation for the benefit of society. The next theme, uh, research integrity and the engaged university. Here I will focus on fostering integrity in research. Integrity in research would have to be fostered by individual researchers, research institutions, funders, and journal editors. Institutions should invest adequately in research integrity capacity within their institutions. Training should be provided in research ethics and research integrity. To create a, a healthy publication climate, which incentivizes researchers to optimize quality and integrity than merely quantity. Engaged universities should create a climate that encourages and supports researchers 
in the active adherence to ethical principles and professional standards essential for the responsible conduct of research. Institutions are therefore encouraged to develop indicators of responsible research practices. Then the next theme is on research collaborations domestically and internationally. Engaged and collaborative research were identified as key enablers in the conduct of research. There is a need to embrace both national and international collaboration to advance the quality and impact of research and innovation. Research collaboration requires inclusive partnerships such as higher education institutions, government, industry, NGOs, science councils, etc., that are mutually beneficial based on shared principles, goals, and objectives. Development challenges are transnational and transdisciplinary, and therefore require both domestic and international collaborations to address them effectively and meaningfully. The need to foster, enhance, and expand collaboration between scientists in Africa was highlighted. And more importantly, the need to strengthen collaboration amongst universities in South Africa beyond geographical limitations. Issues of funding, as we would have expected, were highlighted as potential barriers. In conclusion, the Research and Innovation Strategy Group will meet in the next two weeks to incorporate the insights gleaned at the conference in the finalization of its 2022 priorities that will be submitted to the USAF board at the end of October. We will then develop our action plan for 2022 informed by the list of priorities. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, Toko. Thank you for that. So next up is Professor uh, Siswe Mabizela, who is the Vice Chancellor of Rhodes University uh, in his role as Chairperson of the USAF Teaching and Learning Strategy Group. Siswe. Thank you very much, Chair. The themes that were pursued under teaching and learning are the following. The engaged university and the teaching and learning decolonization and scholarship. Teaching and learning at the theory praxis nexus. And the last one was community engagement. Chair, any attempt to summarize the rich, thought provoking and insightful work that was done during these discussions would really do a huge injustice. Um, and so I just wish to thank our presenters, our speakers, and our chairs uh, for all that they have done. And the conference itself has provided a deeply reflective and challenging engagement. There are a number of constant and recurring themes, or light motifs, if you like, that kept emerging throughout the conference or throughout our presentations. First, our universities should affirm their rootedness in Africa as African universities and not as universities in Africa. And that this rootedness should not just be contained in mission and vision statements, but must be reflected in the everyday interaction of staff, students, and communities. It must be reflected in the university's orientation in respect of teaching and learning, research and innovation, and community engagement. Second very important theme which emerged throughout was that public universities 
exist to serve the public good. The third theme, universities must deeply embed themselves in their societies, not as an act of charity, but as a recognition of our common humanity and our shared destiny. And the fourth theme was that universities must be responsive to the needs of our society. And they need to be responsive to the intrinsic capability expanding citizen building role of higher education. That this requires constant engagement with and reflection on research, daily interaction with national and institutional policy, a reflective research-driven understanding of curriculum development, delivery, and pedagogical practice, and ultimately a responsive engagement with the aspirations and needs of students in the learning environment. And the fifth theme was that higher education should aim to produce graduates who are critical, ethically engaged, democratic, and committed to the common good. Graduates who can be agents of social change and societal transformation. Graduates who would not just be content to see the society or our society or the world as it is, but can imagine a better society and a better world and can work with courage and conviction at, for the realization of such a society in such a way, a world. A graduate who is committed to social justice, environmental justice, and human rights. So there was a lot of discussion about the curriculum and curriculum which was highlighted as a, a change factor. It was noted that it is a wicked problem, but also an opportunity which has been neglected uh, hitherto. It is also shaped by interlocking factors, the most central being social context. What was pointed out was that the curriculum is what counts as valid knowledge. So it is critical to, con to consider what underlies our curriculum choices. We were cautioned about conflating two different but related notions. On the one hand, you have the, the academic curriculum in the sense of certain knowledge, the grammar of knowledge, and what is taught in the form of space. And the institutional curriculum, knowledge that is encoded in the beliefs and the values and behaviors that are embedded in institutional life. These are not the same and changing one does not necessarily mean that you're also changing the other. It was pointed out that curriculum reviews need to be explicit about the generality of knowledge and power and must interrogate whose interests dominate. And what this means, uh, this implies embracing a pedagogy that has due regard for how learning takes place, how the who the learner is, and what it is there is to know. That the curriculum must help students make sense of the grammar of various disciplines and democratic pedagogy, so that there is a transparent relationship between the academic and the student that allows for recognition of the full being of the student. We need greater involvement of students in curricular design. Some of, some, of some of the initiatives presented in the session reflect how powerful their contribution can be. And in the context of curriculum development and renewal, using practice as a reflective anchor speaks to putting emphasis on the interpretation of curriculum as experiences, in addition to the content, activities, and outcomes. Such an interpretation involves engaging in reflective and practical activities that enrich the experiences 
of both students and academics. The future requires graduates who are critical thinkers and who can articulate themselves. So we had a very rich discussion on the fourth industrial revolution. And what has to be recognized is that technology is just a tool, data and information that fuel uh, development. What the post-school sector system has to become, the point is that the post-school system has to become more agile and shift from disciplinary focused programs uh, to catering for a more holistic and broader range of abilities required for success at work. We also had a lovely discussion about how universities need to work with professional bodies. Professional and statutory bodies play a significant role in the education and preparation of graduates who pursue qualifications oriented towards the profession. And that universities should engage with professional bodies um, in such a way that the curricula intended for the education and preparation of graduates for their prof profession are regularly revised and updated to incorporate the latest developments in the profession. And such an engagement uh, and strong collaboration and cooperation between universities and professional bodies can ensure a better alignment between knowledge that underpins the profession and the competencies and skills that are required by the profession and that, that properly aligns with knowledge, skills and competencies that are developed by universities. And in this way, the expectations of both graduates, employers, uh, and also our society will be better served. And just to underline the critical importance of partnerships between universities and professional bodies, Saka pointed out that the profession of accounting was dependent on universities for a formal competency-based academic education. That is the starting point on the route to becoming a CA. But it is also essential to ensure supply from school. And that cycle was doing a lot of work with the Department of Basic Education, particularly in the area of mathematics. Chair, the last important aspect that we engaged on was community engagement. Here yeah, a point was made that universities were there for the public good and must engage graduates in ways that transcend disciplines and promote responsible citizenship. And this speaks to the importance of going beyond producing skilled and competent graduates, but people who can lead, who can see problems and find new ways to solve all problems. And I think a point was made that university's primary role is not to produce graduates who were work ready, but to produce young people for the future who have to solve problems that are not even known yet, who can deal with complex issues, who can deal with uncertainty, but young people who can lead. Uh, just drawing to a close, uh, Chair, noting that the majority still existed in abject poverty, uh, which itself is a consequence of rising inequality. It was pointed out that there was a need to understand the obligation of our disciplines, including philosophy, uh, to our students in the decolonizing uh, that needs to take place. Presentations constantly reinforce the view that the engaged university is committed to direct interaction with its constituent communities through the mutually beneficial exchange, exploration, and application of knowledge, application of expertise and information. Community engagement is then focused on the co-creation of knowledge by a range of people in a wider ecosystem with the university as a co-agent. 
And this more inclusive knowledge generation is transdisciplinary and incorporates an intrinsic respect for the expertise and experience of everyone, including those outside of the academy. And it dismantles the hierarchies of how knowledge is created and used beyond the processes in the classroom, the content that is embedded must conscientize students to work on issues that matter to them. Let me just conclude uh, uh, by recommending two books very highly. And I really believe that these are books that must be read by any person in higher education. And they are very central to our deliberations since Wednesday. Wednesday. The first one is written by Professor Suma Kenna and Chris Ibawi, and it is titled, Understanding Higher Education, Alternative Perspectives. And the second one uh, is written by Professor Chris Brink, and it is titled, The Soul of a University, Why Excellence is Not Enough. I wish to thank all the presenters and chairpersons in the teaching and learning uh, sessions, uh, Professor Vasureddy, Professor Liz Lange, Ms. Trudy van Veig, Professor Francois Stradom, Dr. Tandy Lowen, Ms. Chantel Mulder, Mr. Robert Zwane, Dr. Noel Tandy Tony, Professor Vivian Levac, uh, Mr. Sisebo Kumalo, Professor Reisua Bagwan, all I can say to all of you, Yavashdorsnik. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Sizwe. That was wonderful. Uh, next up is Professor Gerald Omar, who is the uh, Senior Director of Institutional Planning at the University of Pretoria. And he's going to provide us with some feedback in uh, his role as uh, a member of the USAF Funding Strategy Group. Thank you very much, Professor Omar. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just trying to put up my presentation. Um, one second, please. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Gerald Omer. I'm standing in for the chairperson of the Funding Strategy Group, uh, Professor Tawana Kupe, uh, who is also the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria. Like colleagues who have spoken already, I'd like to thank members of the Funding Strategy Group for their input in putting together these themes and for all their work in uh, making our sessions uh, the success that it was. I also would like to thank uh, Ahmed and his team at USAF, Linda, uh, Bernadette and Felicity especially, who worked with uh, quite closely. I'd like to thank the various chairpersons of the three sessions, um, the presenters and of course, those who attended and post, uh, uh, posted important questions, which enriched the, 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 the discussions in the three sessions. Chair, our three themes were sustainable university funding in an equal society. That was quite deliberate given the context that we find ourselves, ourselves in. Um, uh, Dr. Mabizela touched on some of that context, the poverty, the inequality and all that, uh, the, the way the economy is performing. So the idea was to you know, get an understanding of what's happening at the moment and find ways of ensuring that we are sustainable. As we all know, we can only perform our role as vibrant knowledge institutions if we are sustainable. Then of course, we had to start thinking about the future. And so we had to look at funding for infrastructure development. The idea was to reimagine space here, to reimagine infrastructure, to rethink the idea of brick and mortar and uh, to think quite uh, critically uh, uh, about uh, investing in digital transformation, digital uh, technologies, both for our teaching and learning and also for research, and of course, for community engagement. Then again, the important question of university shared services, looking at the drivers, the benefits, the success factors and the challenges. Now, if I could go straight to the question of sustainable university funding, the point was made that financial sustainability of universities is, is closely tied to the intellectual life of, of the university. As I mentioned earlier, as, an organiza as organizations, we need to be financially sustainable for us to be able to provide an excellent education to our students, for us to be able to future-proof our students, for us to be able to pursue research that matters, that makes a difference in society, 
that achieves the impact that we desire and for us to be able to engage meaningfully with our multiple publics and communities. So it's quite critical that we are financially sustainable. You know, we have to guarantee our existence. If we do not exist, we'll not be able to pursue our intellectual projects. Then the point was made here that the crisis of education funding, as I mentioned earlier, is intricately linked with the broader context that we find ourselves in in this country, the context of poverty, increasing inequality, the context of unemployment, you know, and as we know, the economy has not been performing well since the 2008 uh, economic crisis. We kind of have not recovered fully. We've not grown beyond 2% since around about 2013, 2014. Last year, as we know, you know, the economy, uh, shrunk by about 7%. The data from Statistics SA around um, uh, uh, unemployment shows that uh, un un unemployment levels are growing. This is critical. This is critical in the sense that it has implications for how we are funded, how much is made available to us, both from, from, from government and also from the other publics that we interact with, you know, uh, from industry, and from tuition fees, you know, the kind of cost sharing model that we work with, we have to demonstrate sensitivity to this particular context. And, 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 and also, you know, issues around student debt, these are quite, quite, uh, quite critical. Now, related to those funding challenges is the important question of diversifying revenue sources. It's quite important for us to diversify our, our revenue sources as a way of buffering ourselves against, uh, um, uh, declining funding, funding from our, our, our key funder, especially the state in this case. But what we need to put in mind here is that um, even with diversification, it does not necessarily mean that the, 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 the funds that we generate, especially third stream income, is, is available for us to spend as we wish. The bulk of this funding is encumbered and we cannot just use it as, 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 as we'd like to. And more importantly, we may not be able to use it to solve some of the pre pressing problems such as student fees. So it's, it's quite important that we disaggregate, you know, that, that, that big chunk of money called third stream income and, and develop a better, deep understanding of what it's meant for, where it's coming from. But more importantly, is the need for us to develop our capabilities as universities to be able to attract this funding. It does not just happen. So investors have to invest in fundraising. They have to invest in, uh, in, key, in key structures that are important for fundraising. Now, one participant raised a very important point, I believe, and that is the belief that is the responsibility of the state to fi finance the sector, the higher education sector, completely or nearly so without the involvement of the private uh, 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 sector. Of course, the discussion uh, indicated that this would be a challenge, given some of the issues that we've mentioned, the way the economy is performing, the challenges that we've been, we're experiencing in society. The key point here, Chair, is that this is a contested space. That those who believe the space, the state should shoulder the entire you know, uh, burden of funding the sector. But there are those who understand that from a practical common sense point of view, that may not be possible because of the sheer, you know, uh, uh, I mean, the challenges that we face, you know, that the need for us to support healthcare as well, to support infrastructure, to support security, you know, the demands on the state are, are, are quite significant. And so we need to think creatively and innovatively to make sure that we are sustainable. The second important point has to do with infrastructure development and the need for us to reimagine infrastructure, especially in the context of the ongoing digital transformation. One of the things that COVID-19 has done, as, 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 as the discussion pointed out, is the proliferation and the maturation of digital technologies. Previously, a year or two ago, before COVID, we were talking about the future. We were talking about these digital transformations as something that is going to happen in future, you know, in five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 20 years time. That future is now here and we have to embrace it. And so the point was emphasized that technology is mission critical and it's non-negotiable. And hence the need for us to invest individually and collectively as a sector, working collaboratively in areas such as cloud computing, in quantum technology, in virtual and augmented reality. The transition to online education means that we have to invest in those technologies. We have to invest in immersive technologies, you know, our pedagogies, technologies that will support immersive pedagogies, you know. Uh, this, this, this is quite important, uh, Chair. 
And of course, we cannot do this alone. We need to work together with, with partners, the state, the private sector, you know, uh, in the context of digital technologies, we have to work with the telcos. It's very important that we pull together. And the, 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 the session emphasized that probably it might be, it might serve the sector better if we pull together as a sector and engage with, with the various stakeholders as a sector and, and find a way of making these resources available to everyone given the challenges, the inequalities that we face in the sector. If we leave it to individual universities, some universities might be left behind. Then of course, the important question of uh, uh, private, uh, public private partnerships to deliver infrastructure more effectively and quickly. So there was a robust conversation around here, you know, um, the challenges around this um, the post 2015, 2016 period, remember with PPPs, especially around student accommodation, you know, a lot of them were dependent on uh, accommodation fees. That has not, has now become um, a contested space as well, you know, in terms of the, the, the capping of accommodation fees and, and tuition fees as well. So it was emphasized that we need to find a balance. PPPs are critical, they're important but we need to find a balance between the risks and the outcomes that we seek to pursue. The last session chair, an equally important one, uh, focused on shared services, you know, looking at the drivers, looking at the benefits, looking at success factors and challenges. We had four very accomplished speakers who shared very insightful uh, ideas around, around this question of shared services. So the one important point that was made that shared services, especially in the context that we find ourselves in, where resources are becoming even more scarce, is that they are important, they are an important driver of sustainability in higher education. This is something that we need to, to, to embrace as a sector. And then uh, again, uh, uh, universities uh, uh, were, were said to be good candidates for shared services. This is something that is more advanced in, in the private sector um, uh, in a number of countries, in, in the UK, in, in, in Finland, in, in New Zealand, in the US. So we are saying we need to embrace this in, in, in the sector here. You know, uh, there are quite a number of services that we offer where there is room for us to go the route of shared services, you know, in finance, in student administration, in HR, in, in, in uh, 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 IT. So we had a, a, a number of case studies. The one is the, the UK, you know, GISC network. It's quite huge, this sheer scale and scope. It's, it's quite huge, you know, uh, involved in, uh, with the cloud, involved with uh, land analytics, technology services. It involves all the universities and colleges in the UK. It's, it's, it's big. Then we also looked at the DHET, uh, driven shared services around the joint application system, infrastructure, and quite a number of other uh, 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 services as well. And then, of course, our own tenants. The discussion focused on the benefits. It looked at the success factors and some of the challenges. And some of the, the benefits that were, were put forward include higher productivity, you know, quality improvement, reduced systems infrastructure costs, um, um, accessing expertise that may not be available to individual players, accessing advanced technology, very, very important. Some of the success factors, and a lot of these came from the tenant presentation, um, include institutional buy-in. We have to clearly indicate what the gains are for everyone involved. We have to manage the tension between competition and collaboration. Of course, accountability is very important and also collaboration with the state. The, the tenant case study illustrated this. The, the, the GISC uh, network also illustrated this. The GISC network receives uh, a, a block grant from the UK government to support this. Very, very important. In terms of some of the challenges, Chair, that were raised include the inadequate funding, concerns around uh, loss of autonomy, skills to run the shared services, and then, of course, the big question of complying with, with uh, uh, privacy laws, you know, POPI and, and related privacy laws. So, Chair, the whole the key thing in all these three conversations was around the sustainability of higher education institutions. It was about reimagining higher education institutions. We live in particular contexts. These contexts are local and these contexts are global. We cannot ignore these contexts. We need to work together. Collaboration is not antith antithetical to, to um, distinctiveness. 
as, 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 as individual institutions. So we need to leverage all this, be able to pull together and be able to provide a good quality education to our students, be able to support research that makes a difference in society and be able to interact with the various communities in ways that make a difference. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Uma. Certainly lots of food for thought there in that uh, feedback. So um, the next up is Professor Puleng Lankabula, who is the Vice Chancellor, University of South Africa, who will provide us with uh, perspectives uh, in her role as Chairperson of the USAF Transformation Strategy Group. Uh, Professor Lankapula. Good afternoon, uh, Prof. Can you hear me? Yes. Please okay. go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to have been asked to reflect and re report on behalf of the Transformation Strategy Group. I want to state that uh, the three sessions that undergirded the discussions on engaged uh, university, engaged scholarship, and the questions of transformation were quite uh, exciting, uh, brought some scholarly insights that are themselves transformative to the whole cycle of the knowledge systems within the university sectors. In particular, I want to acknowledge uh, the colleagues uh, within the transformation task group that have become uh, central to the collation and formation of the inputs that we are going to be uh, giving. The first is uh, Professor Andre Kidd, uh, Professor Sibusi Sochalufu, um, Professor Chris Brink, uh, who presented and who has been acknowledged, uh, Mr. Lutando Jack, uh, the Dean of Students of Nelson Mandela, Nobubele Lopuza, Pamela Dube, Professor Vipia Val from University of the Free State, and uh, Professor Pakin, uh, some of those who presented. Uh, the key issues that, that were sent. Professor Langabula, I think we, we, we've lost you. Yes, thank you very much. As testament to the alienation of our students, whether in the curriculum environments, but also the core curricular environments. And these are the areas that I'll enunciate on. And the third aspect of the thematic focus uh, that was attended to was the principles of contextuality, globalization, and globalized knowledge as parts of the teaching and learning, research and innovation, and engaged scholarship as yeah. side of transformative and engaged universities. Professor Lengabula, sorry to interrupt you. We, we lost you just at the start when you, when you were going to tell us about the three, three themes that you wanted to <coughs> highlight. So we heard the third one, if you could just repeat the first two. Yes, the first two, I apologize, I don't know what happened. The first one is about uh, uh, the, the engaged university and transformation, uh, uh, student-centered uh, universities and responsive universities, the issues of alienation and inclusion, as well as the questions of um, uh, um, the triad of teaching and learning, research and innovation, and engaged scholarship. I must start uh, with the, in my introductory remarks to, to stating that the first session acknowledged the shifts that have taken place within the context of uh, COVID-19, but also the advances in the digitalization systems, which are occasioning new ways of interfacing as universities, whilst at the same time, acknowledging the critical roles of university as the custodian in the core construction environment for knowledge arena, teaching and learning, research and innovation, as well as global impact or knowledge impact. The, cre the key critical questions that ensued in the first session was around the idea of a university that embodies students who are co-constructors of the knowledge trajectories that are embedded 
within the university system. This idea of co-governance, co-participation, and co-construction of knowledge was quite considered central. And this particular issue was seen as relevant for the core academic agenda, but also for the core curricular agenda, which is the idea of entwining what happens within the laboratory, the classroom, whether physical or virtual, but also within the context within which the learning takes place. The questions around the deep professionalization of the core, the core curricular environments became an important imperative signaled by, amongst others, the questions of in, a non-inclusivity or exclusivities that were highlighted as areas of concerns within the university. The other matters that were raised uh, in terms of the academic and scientific agenda of professionalization in order that the engaged university is not just a site of learning, but also a translation, uh, that idea of ensuring that the aesthetics, philosophies, curriculum, pedagogics, and other associated issues that are aspects of the learning program are entwined. The third aspect, which was highly emphasized uh, by Professor Kidd, was that idea of education in ethical, empathetic, and engaged citizens or students who do not only learn the careers trajectory that they want to undertake, but who create a humanizing environment in which they flourish as students, but also uh, the, the academy, particularly taking the context of decoloniality, the ideas of Africanizing knowledge arena, whilst at the same time ensuring that African knowledge systems, civilizations, and intellectuals interface with the global knowledge uh, systems uh, find support and resonance within the global arena. The last part uh, in terms of the first uh, set of uh, the, 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 the sessions that we have, which I want to emphasize is this idea of universities as engaged uh, uh, environments within the shifts in the 4.0 industrialization and digitalization. This has become an important, if not a contested arena on the idea of technology as enabling or leveraging an engaged university. The key intellectual and scientific contradictions that were identified as challenges or impediments to an engaged uh, university was the fact that uh, in the context of the global South, the ownership systems of digital platforms that are used for teaching and as well, the 4.0 industrialization typologies are to a large extent within the South African context or the global South areas of concerns that may mitigate these ideas, that may hamper the prospects of this idea of engaged scholarship. For in the main, universities are currently engaging with the global digitalization systems as consumers and not inventors and innovators of the systems that leverage the engaged uh, university. Therefore, it will be important for you, SAF, to reflect around these aspects of transformation, digitalizations, uh, especially the questions of ownership, consumer, cult consumer uh, status, as well as the prejudicial aspects, especially associated with the uh, algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence, predictive systems that sometimes shape discourses of transformation and sometimes are at the center 
of prejudicial systems that promote marginalization, alienation, especially of uh, that are gendered, that are associated with disabilities uh, questions, a geographic location, but also languages, especially African languages. So these are, these are quite important uh, uh, areas that um, would, would be, um, the, the other aspect that was highlighted as an important criteria in the knowledge arena to be considered is the idea of knowledge not being benign to freeing, to free, being free of prejudices, but also the politics of alienation and marginalization. And these were seem to be important if they were to be just opposed with questions of inclusivity, of uh, knowledge systems that are student centric, uh, but also which ensure that they position the students, the scientific agenda, scientific diplomacy, pedagogics at the center of ensuring that students move from rhetoric to reality and reality to theorization and ensuring that that triad of learning, of uh, curriculum, of uh, lived and concrete experiences of the students within and outside the university become the rallying point for enhancing engaged scholarship within and outside the university system. The, 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 the other aspect that we've raised, which um, somewhat uh, uh, align with the previous presentation, were on the issues of financing and funding of university systems, which are quite important if universities' financing systems and structures are not strengthened, then the idea of being contextually relevant, globally competitive, and globally in partnership with other universities in other environments such as Asia, uh, Europe, Americas, and Australia would not be evident. And therefore that idea of exposing our students, our academics, especially taking into consideration the experiences of apartheid that negated the interface of those on the underside, the margins, but also whose scholarly uh, aspects and thematic focus or scholarly articulation is not at the center. Scholarships such as decolonial scholarship, anti-colonial scholarship, inventive measures which are not necessarily central to mainstream knowledge arena could be enhanced. Then uh, in the second, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the third day, uh, on the third uh, sets of uh, discussions, we had a strong uh, idea of uh, publications, research and productivity and the diversities of research approaches as important areas of thinking through engaged scholarship. As part of this uh, mapping of the key areas of uh, or discourse analysis around engaged universities were undertaken, and this will be entailed uh, in the report. And some of the questions that undergirded these ideas of responsive universities in context of crisis were also seen as really identifying what is it that we're good at? What do we do in the context of shifts and changes? Do we remain a cave, dormant? Do we become agile? But do we also uh, limit ourselves to just uh, wanting to be seen in the uh, uh, mimicking the global or Euro-American systems. And I think this is quite an important area to emphasize because the question that a student uh, asked who has uh, responded is, do we create decolonial African intellectuals, African knowledge systems to respond to Euro-American civilizations or do we create contextually relevant uh, knowledge systems that interface 
with Euro America's knowledge systems in order to invent and re become responsive. So this is quite an important. The confusion between the concept of transformation and the issues of race discourse is an element that uh, requires attention. And this was raised as an important area. How do we think around intersectionality as an important idea of leveraging an engaged university without creating the dissonances or chasm between people, between knowledge systems, and between the roles of university in the context within which they exist, but also as global knowledge participants. Uh, and this question was related to questions of rankings, ratings, and global impact. Are the rankings particularly enabling us to seeing the roles of universities in the socio-economic, political, and ecological transformations, or are they just a criteria that are limited to the outputs in terms of books, publications, and research? And how, what is the role of global impact of Professor engagement? Professor Linda you, you, you have about a minute or so left. Yes, yes, I'm aware of that, uh, of engagement, as well as of the knowledge arena. And therefore the suggestion that was made is that it will be important in creating a responsive uh, university that the innovative aspect in terms of the scientific agenda, the contextual agility, the global agility and entwining the knowledge arena with the developments within society would be integral, including questions of the National Development Plan, the issues of Africa Agenda 2063 and associated uh, global um, uh, 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 development uh, discussions in order that uh, universities in Africa are not just located in Africa, but also advance themselves as sites of excellence, knowledge dissemination and inventive approaches in their aesthetics formation, but also in the diversities of students and staff that they embody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lengabula. Appreciate that. Uh, the last strategy group to report back uh, will be the Yousef World of Work strategy group and Professor Ahmed Bawa will do that on behalf of that group. Ahmed. Uh, Professor De Villiers and uh, it gives me pleasure to do this on behalf of uh, Professor Marwala, who can't be with us, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I report really uh, on a set of notes that he sent me, and uh, I hope that they uh, that I present sort of in a coherent fashion. Um, there were there were two major kind of sessions, if you like. The one was uh, you know, universities, the new technology moment, and society, and the second had to do with uh, with entrepreneurship. Uh, and modern technologies in the labor market. So I'll, I'll deal with both of those. The first one is divided into two sections. The one section relates to universities directly, and the second relates to uh, the nature of work and the requirements of society. So, uh, so there are three sections altogether. I'll be, I'll be quite brief. Um, the issues relating to the university, first of all, relating to universities, the new technology moment in society, um, and uh, there, there were deep concerns raised about the, the ability and capability of universities as institutions to navigate the changes uh, that will require the, you know, that will require them to be agile uh, in this new moment of uh, this new technology moment that we are in. And this might actually require the reimagining of their present form, that it might require kind of reshaping uh, the form of the university, and uh, and 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 also uh, that there will have to be a process to reimagine the learner uh, in the context of these changes that are taking place, uh, and and of course I think we we began to see that during COVID nineteen, uh, universities must use technology for collaboration. That 
uh, that that what COVID nineteen has taught us is that it's that there should now be very little excuse for universities uh, not to collaborate with each other and with uh, kind of other partners, if you like, and that uh, that technology should be uh, should be used uh, for this in a much more vigorous fashion. Um, in its present form. Uh, there are deep concerns about the fact that higher education continues to be relatively low tech, uh, even in the way that we use technology uh, for, co you know, in the context of COVID-19, uh, and 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 that we uh, and that it therefore faces strong risks from these major technological changes that are taking place. And one example of this is just the risk uh, of uh, falling behind in terms of the global offering of programs and qualifications as that progresses at a furious rate. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard quite recently about the, uh, the, the University of the People based in the United States, which is now offering programs at very, very low cost to students uh, across the world. Uh, so that's, you know, that's the kind of concern, uh, that was the kind of concern that was raised. Um, universities uh, should become hubs of innovation uh, if they focus, if they are to focus on the employability of students. And I think what this means is that, uh, you know, that as uh, that our graduates, as they enter the labor market, will be required to be uh, kind of uh, 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 innovators, creative and so on. And that universities have to embody these kind of characteristics if they are to produce graduates that will have these characteristics. Um, the value of the university, uh, there's, there's a clear recognition you know, that the value of the university is in knowledge creation uh, uh, and, that, uh, and that there has to be collaboration, if you like, and engagement in, uh, in addressing knowledge creation for the common good. Uh, and of course, at the heart of that again, is this idea of using technology for co-creation of uh, of this of this of the knowledge uh, of of knowledge and so on? A different type of higher education leadership needs to emerge. Uh, the idea being that uh, that that higher education leadership needs to uh, take on board the grand challenges we face uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the new technology moment and and to be driven from. Uh, uh, from 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 the from leadership, if you like, uh, given the technological changes, the future of the university as an employer is likely to change, uh, and this is really relating to the gig economy. Academ academics will increasingly serve as consultants, uh, selling their expertise to multiple universities. And the big question, of course, will be what does this mean in terms of quality management and so on. So, just this idea that academics uh, will might increasingly uh, work for more than one uh, knowledge-intensive institution uh, might be on the table, and 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 that this uh, this has implications for the future of the university as an employer. Um, uh, the COVID the COVID pandemic showed up uh, not only the technological problems that many students faced, inability to access laptops and data, and the lack of resources to travel and so on, but also the lack of uh, a lack of related skills. Uh, now that of course has enormous implications that you know if students uh, do not have the requisite skills you know when they come to university then that has implications for their participation in uh, universities that are taking on the use of technology in a much more vibrant way with increasing numbers of role players such as uh, training providers uh, like google and ibm and so on certification will no longer be largely in the hands of universities uh, what, what this means basically is that there'll be uh, other avenues for certification, other avenues for skills development, and that universities must either keep up with this or find uh, the niche that fits for them, if you like it. Um, and, and alongside this, of course, it's just this uh, kind of this notion that, um, that universities have to become uh, uh, more kind of geared for for lifelong learning, uh, that they have to ensure that they are geared for broader uh, um, uh, uh, audiences, that, uh, that they will have to address the needs of socially mature students, 
uh, and to build the capacity to, uh, to contribute to lifelong learning. So those are the thoughts around issues relating to the university. Now, issues relating to the world of work and the requirements of society, um, it, uh, there's a, there was a general view that the speed at which the university, that the use of technologies, uh, that the use of the, of the, the change, sorry, the use of technologies uh, under the impetus of the pandemic, that this was uh, largely uh, not anticipated. Uh, and that universities and uh, society more generally were caught unawares. And, and, and having said that, I mean, what, is also, what was also clear was just how quickly the uh, uptake was, uh, was accelerated, if you like. If it, is, it is not possible to quantify the impact of the technological change on jobs, but it is clear that it is going to be extensive with the impact being felt particularly by people in the mid-level routine jobs uh, which can and will be automated. And I think if we look at the banking sector, that's happening already. Um, however, what will remain critical are the soft skills, uh, which will remain critical, and also skills around uh, kind of uh, 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 technical skills, if you like, uh, they, they, might, they might remain important. Uh, with machines taking over certain human functions, uh, there will have to be a, a role for universities in helping students and non-students rethink their own role in society. Uh, just kind of this, uh, this, this move towards the kind of post-human societies, if you like, will, is something that we haven't even begun to engage with. Uh, massive amounts of data are enabling machine learning, and this is going to have enormous impacts on the nature of our society uh, and in particular around uh, the use of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, deep learning and so on, and the impact of those on, uh, uh, on, on various aspects of uh, human existence. So for example, you know, uh, to what extent will uh, this kind of machine learning contribute to uh, uh, changing the way in, in which uh, human, uh, human health is considered uh, uh, insurance is dealt with and so on. Um, changes that are occurring will force the need for flexibility and I've spoken to this to, to some extent uh, with the skilled individuals having strong bargaining power. Uh, and this raises the question who controls the power relations. So in other words, the, you know, as technology uh, begins to take force, uh, 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 what we're going to see is the need for us to revisit the way in which uh, power relations are distributed in the system. Uh, technology can cut out, cut out uh, in inverted commas, the middleman, uh, and therefore jobs in that space for, you know, will be lost. Uh, for example, uh, one can think about the commercial music distribution industry, that uh, very many artists now are in the space of distributing their own, uh, their own music, uh, and, and that that category of individual that was involved in music distribution uh, will no longer be there. Um, people fear being displaced, but are inevitably forced to change. And this might have kind of psychosocial kind of implications and so on. And what, uh, and, and then finally in this category, uh, this particular kind of topic, if you like, um, the, there'll be a big question. There's a big question being raised about you know, what are the individual talents that will, be, that must be defined by universities uh, as they can, as, this, as these technologies take hold. So it's, it's really about linking with what uh, 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 Dr. Babizela spoke about earlier, which is, you know, what are the implications for the curriculum and so on as we head into this new era. Uh, finally, Chair, just to look at the issue of entrepreneurship and the modern technologies in the labor market. Uh, the, the, the big question, it seems to me, is preparing students, that was raised, is preparing students for an unpredictable future. Uh, and that we have to build the capacity of students to imagine uh, and to be curiosity driven. So in other words, saying that, uh, that we have to create learners of our graduates. That is not enough for us just to produce people for the labor market, but to try and ensure that they can uh, build the, imagine, the imagination capacity and their 
and and their ability to uh, to navigate this new world, if you like, after they graduate. Um, there needs to be a much closer interaction between the higher education providers and the employers, uh, and in particular because of the rapidity of the change, uh, that there needs to be uh, kind of real-time curriculum redesign. And this can really only happen in the interaction, in the engagement between higher education and employers. Um, there's going to be an increasing virtualization of teaching and training, and that uh, this will have to be co-created as far as possible with the external environment. It's, to some extent, it's what I mentioned in the previous statement. Uh, learning will increasingly become part of many environments. So in other words, meaning that, uh, uh, that, you know, that this question of lifelong learning becomes increasingly relevant and there'll be a growing need for instructional design, uh, designers. Uh, training increasingly makes use of simulation, chatbots, augmented and virtual re reality and animation. And this will have enormous, enormous implications for teaching programs. So in other words, that there'll be a, a growing market for, uh, for, for individuals who uh, can produce uh, these kinds of uh, technology-based uh, learning programs. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an increasing awareness in the US among students and surveys indicate this, that many young people wish to start their own businesses in, even while they are at university. And uh, they want to make social difference. They want to make us, uh, they want to be agents of change and so on. And they have personal drive. Now that kind of study hasn't been done here yet, but uh, this is uh, you know, what has been found in the UK. Um, there's clearly a, uh, a, a, a change in hiring decisions, uh, which are very different from the pre from previously. Uh, just to give you an example, you know, there's uh, very often what is asked of individuals now when they apply for jobs is, you know, not what qualification you have, but what can you do, you know, and what have you done, and what can you do. So the issue around, uh, you know, just how you know how do our curricula and how do our training programs. Uh, fit with that kind of new uh, employment uh, environment. Uh, entrepreneurship is a combination of art and skill involving modeling, framing, and performing. And uh, that kind of speaks to this kind of, this purposefulness of bringing together uh, kind of different domains of knowledge into our programs. Uh, here's an important point, right? Employment will be lost in some sectors and in others it will be retained. Uh, there will be, and there will be growth in other sectors. So, so, so there's going to be a shift in the way in the way in which the labour market is made up. Uh, research has has provided evidence that there will be um, that there will be winners and losers eh? with demand, for example, for knowledge workers and creative thinkers and professional managers. But mid-level routine jobs will likely be replaced by machines. And lower end jobs may largely survive as they are difficult to replace with machines. So uh, the, what this means is that, uh, is that, you know, that, that we have to pay attention to what is happening in the labor, what is likely to happen in the labor market uh, and, and to then understand what the role of universities is within that. Uh, and then finally, uh, new perspectives on work and technology uh, there'll be, you know, there'll be kind of shorter working weeks, uh, which could uh, also improve the quality of life, uh, provide adults with more time with uh, family and children, and, uh, and, and that the human aspect of these, uh, of these technology changes should not be ignored. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's, that's it. I, you know, I hope I've represented uh, Professor Marwala uh, sufficiently well there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Uh, and I want to thank uh, all the speakers who've contributed to this session. We've gone somewhat over time, but I believe this was an excellent uh, summary of uh, the conference proceedings as well. So we've heard from the respective strategy groups, from research and innovation, teaching and learning, the funding strategy group, transformation strategy group, and also the world of work strategy group. And uh, all the participants, I really want to thank, for, thank them for very careful, uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking uh, prepared remarks and presentations. 
And I would certainly, uh, this would now go back to USAP and the respective groups as well. And I would certainly want this to be uh, included in the conference uh, proceedings. I think this was, this was tremendously, uh, tremendously insightful. So I'm gonna bring this session to, a chair, uh, to, to an end now. Uh, this is session 15. So we've got uh, two relatively short sessions remaining and I think uh, I'm going to hand over directly to you, Ahmed. Uh, speaking on the conference outcomes or not? Thank, thank you so much, uh, Chair and uh, uh, I'm going to be very brief now because we are over time. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, that it's been a wonderful kind of two and a half days with lots of learnings and so on. And uh, just to say that one of our big challenges is going to be to try and understand, you know, what we learned from this conference and what we can then institute into the activities of USAF and, and into our universities, of course. I mean, ultimately that's the big challenge, uh, but also to begin to reshape the relationship between universities and, uh, the, and, the, um, uh, and, and our publics, if you like. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank the CHE for co-hosting this event. That the CHE uh, sessions uh, added much flavor to the conference and I, and I think that that's a, a wonderful outcome. Uh, uh, the theme proved to have captured the attention of the participants. There's been a lot of discussion, a lot of detailed discussion, and I think it's going to be a wonderful exercise now to try and uh, kind of gather from those inputs, you know, just what we, what we have learned from them. Uh, and I think that it's going to be an interesting, uh, uh, ex uh, an interesting period of time for our strategy groups. Um, there was a general consensus throughout the meeting that the upending of our system since 2015 with the fees must fall, roads must fall, and then COVID, that, that, we must, that this must lead to, a new, to new imaginations of our institutions and system. Uh, that actually this is an opportunity for us to really rethink the system. And I think what we heard from Ira Harkavi and Hilige Fadlant, um, uh, you know, the international kind of perspectives that were presented to us, was that these are challenges that not uh, that that are not challenges that face that are unique to South Africa? That they are challenges that are really in, you know involved in the global uh, in the global sort of higher education enterprise, if you like. There, there were clearly some you know what were identified as disruptive agents. You know the this new technology moment and its implications are clearly one one of them. Uh, they, you know we heard uh, repeatedly in all. The, you know, all the kind of report backs uh, by, from the strategy groups that uh, there's, there's an evolving, there's a need for the evolving of the knowledge project of our system. And in particular, the challenge around addressing the grand challenges we have. Um, a, a lot of emphasis on uh, learning at the theory praxis nexus, if you like, that we need to bring together theory and, uh, and, and practice and, and, and get students to be involved in uh, at that nexus, if you like. Um, there was strong recommendations throughout the meeting for building collaborations within and outside the system. Uh, and that, you know, and that that is really at the heart of uh, uh, kind of this, this issue around uh, building uh, kind of social ownership of our universities. So converge, you know, that, uh, that, that uh, you know, the, the idea of converging knowledge domains in our curricula, bringing together the science and the humanities was a recurring theme that we really need to expose our students to uh, both, you know, both domains of knowledge and other domains of knowledge and bring them, you know, bring them to, uh, together into, uh, into an interesting mix, if you like. Uh, the issue around flexible lifelong learning and in particular with the use of technology uh, giving access to non-traditional students, these are all critical uh, issues. And, uh, and, and there were warnings throughout the, throughout the meeting uh, about understanding the location of the universities uh, in, the, in, the, in the broad political economy uh, uh, is critical because, because of the way in which that broad political economy might undermine, if you like, uh, these very powerful ideas that imagine that in some ways universities have to lift themselves out of you know, what we might think of as the dominant models of production. Um, Chair, I, I was really intrigued by uh, just you know, the, uh, the idea that was raised at the book launch, you know, that 
the one thing that we might have to give consideration to is this idea of uh, of kind of building on the idea of the engaged university to building the idea of uh, the responsive university that is not enough just to be engaged but it's uh, you know, as important to be responsive you know, to the grand challenges and and clearly this is the title of uh, of uh, professor chris brink's new book like right? so uh, so it, it partly was driven by that uh, by the discussion uh, around that uh, book launch if you like uh, and and that was an important kind of thought for me uh, but what I also kind of wanted to raise was uh, just repeatedly what came up was the idea of the funding of engagement. And this was seen as being critical to its ongoing sustainability. Uh, and that we had to move away from the perils of linking engagement to, to soft money, to donor money. Uh, because what that did was uh, kind of really curtail the ongoing uh, 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 the ongoing project of uh, of uh, engagement, if you like. Um, okay, and then uh, you know I was very uh, keen to hear the minister's input. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, you know this is the first time uh, that we've gathered together as a conference where DHET and DSI have come into a single ministry, and that presents a whole range of new opportunities which we have to uh, which we have to address. And of course, the minister, I think, uh, did two things that really interested me. The one was the issue around locating the higher education system firmly within the national system of innovation. Uh, and, 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 and I think, you know, the new decadal plan will speak to that more, uh, more vigorously. And then secondly, uh, it's the issue around the research innovation chasm and the implications of that chasm and trying to understand how uh, you know, the universities, the science councils, uh, the business community, the communities and so on can all work together in uh, addressing the issue of the research innovation channel, uh, chasm. Uh, and then finally, uh, th there were repeated concerns, you know, about the complete absence, well, the, virtually the complete absence of the provincial and local government uh, in, in the knowledge processes that universities engage in. in Kind of getting the universities to be much more kind of integrated into the challenge grant the challenges facing uh, local government and so on. Uh, so chair i i, I think the, um, it seems to me at least that the major challenge for us now is to kind of really work through what we you know what we gathered in these uh, strategy groups uh, uh, and to pick up those issues and to really uh, take them into our communities of practice and take them into our universities and to create new projects and so on. And, uh, and I, I just want to take this opportunity now to thank everybody that attended the meeting and uh, thank the boards of USAF and the CHE, thank USAF and the CHE staff, which are fantastic. Uh, thank Dr. Linda Mayer, who really drove this enterprise. Uh, and then finally, really, uh, to just to bring to everybody's attention that next week is the EDHE Lehotla, and I hope that everybody who's attended this meeting will attend that meeting, because that's also likely to be a very interesting engagement. But with that, what I'd like to do is uh, really uh, invite to Professor Mutua as chair of the board of USAF, and to ask her please to, uh, to, to bring the, uh, the conference to an end. Thank you so much. Professor Mutwa. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bauer and colleagues. Um, I am going to be very brief uh, this afternoon um, uh, because uh, colleagues have uh, from the strategic groups, uh, the VCs and yourself have um, summarized quite eloquently what has happened. And uh, I want to thank Professor Vim de Villiers as well for, for sharing the previous session. <clears throat> So uh, colleagues, peers and friends uh, from the global and national higher education community and from all the sectors of society that have participated in the conference, uh, I greet you this afternoon, but I also want to recognize and greet our student uh, 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 colleagues that participated in the conference. The, this conference, uh, uh, the quality and depth of its deliberation have far exceeded any possibility of me being able to say anything more original than all that has been shared in the last three days.
So it is with great humility that I take this opportunity to make a very few closing remarks on behalf of our organization, Universities South Africa and our partners. In conclusion to my welcome to this conference uh, on Wednesday, I said that if this conference were a metaphorical banquet, you should prepare yourself for a feast and what a feast indeed it has been. Upon reflection, I am convinced that the conference's theme, the engaged university was an inspired choice. It has left us all in no doubt as to the importance of what we do and the necessity for urgent change and transformation. It has always been somewhat ironic that this second oldest institution, the university, in continued existence is also possibly one of the most conservative ones and intractable when it comes to change and its ambition for self-reflection. But the simple fact of its longevity speaks to its capacity and potential to change, on the other hand, quite radically at times as our world has passed through massive and hugely disruptive wars, pandemics, and all manner of revolutions. Sometimes as the university system, we have adapted to the disruptions uh, and sometimes we have led uh, these disruptions like uh, the pandemic has shown, but we have also done the work and we have prevailed. Listening to speaker after speaker over the past three days, one has observed a tacit but powerful acknowledgement that we are again at a global turning point where our relevance, our impact and value to society is being questioned. The message has been clear. It is time to respond and to regroup. We have repeatedly heard that our universities are in society and they are of society. They are generally perceived to be powerful and influential drivers of social transformation and change in concert with, with all levers of government. They are inherently catalytic and transformative. If one has listened thoughtfully, most of our colleagues have confirmed the centrality and embeddedness of the university in national socioeconomic and political transformation and development. Our own minister, as we have indicated, Professor Bauer, uh, Minister Zimande re reiterated and confirmed this in his wide ranging address on Wednesday. This conference has also affirmed that people have and are taking the notion of the engaged responsive university to heart and that it is in fact, a, gro a, a, gro a growing global preoccupation among scholars and practitioners. This has been brought home through many thought provoking insights on notions of engagement and responsiveness, as we have just pointed out, Professor. The majority of which have latched onto the centrality of community involvement in interesting and sometimes very provocative ways, as we have heard in the past three days, we must build on this impetus. The point has also been made that at a time of global disruption and turmoil in higher education, it is an opportune moment to then step back and re-examine notions of the academy that do not fully catalyze our intellectual, our social and our ethical dexterity to deploy our scholarship in service of society, in service of humanity, as we should. Uh, my colleagues uh, in the strategic groups, uh, the vice chancellors, as well as Dr. Omar, have just uh, summarized the sessions. So that is why I did not uh, plan to go over this, but also uh, Professor Bauer has already indicated uh, the outcomes of the conference and the major themes, uh, but also how we will be taking forward the outcomes of the conference. Allow me therefore to only add that it is my sincere exhortation that this wonderful network 
cemented in these past three days will be further enriched and expanded to provide a very solid platform for the reimagination of the knowledge project towards a much more expansive, deliberative and convergent enterprise that we have all alluded to and that we all hope for. In conclusion, therefore, colleagues and friends, it would be remiss of me at this stage if I did not publicly uh, uh, thank and acknowledge the USAF A team staff, as well as our partners in the CHE and DHET, to mention Linda Mayer, Dr. Mayer, who has led the conference with all the colleagues, who have spent months and totally, uh, totally consumed with preparations for this conference. I also want to sincerely thank my colleagues, uh, the chairs of the USAF strategy groups, as well as members of the strategy groups for the role they've played in, le in leading the plans and the honing of the conference themes. The conference has been a great success because of this careful and detailed planning in the background. I've been so proud of the dedication, loyalty and sheer professionalism that have been displayed in ensuring that we have enjoyed the shared feast of the last three days. And I know that I speak on behalf of every participant when I say a very warm and sincere thank you to all for the superb well done. It remains for me uh, on behalf of our organization, the University's South Africa Collective that is represented by the 26 vice chancellors of our 26 universities and our CEO, Professor Bauer, to wish you well in your future em endeavors. I look forward with great anticipation to seeing and hearing about your various efforts and initiatives to promote the ideal and the praxis of an engaged, responsive university. I thank you this afternoon. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, go well. <laughs>